everyone, I'm Norman Wahlberger. In today's famous math problem, we're going to look at the famous Irish mathematician William Rowan Hamilton and his discovery of quaternions in the context of what I call the rotation problem, which is the problem of how do we describe and understand and manipulate rotations in three-dimensional space algebraically. So the motivation for this problem comes from the intimate connection between complex numbers and rotations in the plane. Complex numbers are numbers of the form a plus bi, where i is a kind of imaginary number satisfying i squared equals minus 1. And around Hamilton's time, it was well appreciated that these complex numbers somehow had an intimate connection with the geometry of the plane and in particular allowed an efficient computational calculus for rotations. So the problem that Hamilton posed to himself was what algebraic structure plays an analogous role for rotations in space? If we have rotations in the plane we know we can rely on complex numbers to help us with the algebra. What about rotations in three-dimensional space, which are considerably more subtle and difficult to manipulate? Well, for a long time, Hamilton thought that the answer lied in extending the idea of complex numbers from a two-dimensional algebra to a three-dimensional algebra. In other words, he was thinking about vectors of the form t plus ai plus bj, forget the ck for a moment, and trying to find a way of introducing an algebra structure on these three-dimensional vectors. In other words, a way of multiplying them that allowed one to sort of capture the rotational structure of three-dimensional space. And then on some fateful day in 1843, he was walking with his wife along a canal in Dublin, and was crossing a bridge when this inspiration came to him and he realized that the solution was to consider not a three-dimensional space of vectors but rather a four-dimensional space of vectors. And that the crucial properties satisfied by these new numbers i, j, and k could be captured by these equations. That i squared was equal to minus one, so was j squared, so was k squared. That's much like the complex number situation. And in addition, there's a relationship between i, j, and k, which we can write i times j times k equals minus 1. And he realized this in a flash of insight, and uh, in a small piece of mathematical vandalism, carved this equation into the uh, stonework of the bridge. That's a famous mathematical anecdote, a bit of high drama in the world of pure mathematics. All right. William Hamilton was, no doubt, Ireland's most famous mathematician, a very brilliant fellow who made contributions to physics, optics, and other areas of algebra as well. In addition to his discovery of quaternions, he also built up the theory of quaternions into a very powerful and broad tool for doing physics. That turned out to be um, coming into conflict with another approach uh, to, to vectors um, and ultimately it lost out to our current approach using dot products and cross products. But as we'll see, uh, they're actually closely connected to quaternions as well. Hamilton was also famous for an important insight into classical mechanics. So he took the, the framework of Lagrange that Lagrange had established for understanding Newton's laws and twisted it in an important new direction to give the so-called Hamiltonian formulation of classical mechanics, which not only um, brought into being a subject called symplectic geometry, but also was a very important contributor to the 20th century development of quantum mechanics. All right, so we're going to describe this, this problem, and it's going to take us probably three lectures to do that. So in today's lecture, I want to start by setting the framework, so to speak, by making very clear this connection between complex numbers and rotations in the plane. It turns out that if you look at that subject in the right way, in other words, in a rational way, 
then that makes it much easier to understand what happens with the story with quaternions and rotations in three-dimensional space. So that's what we're going to do today mostly. And then in the next lecture, we're going to talk about rotations and, uh, and how we think about rotations in three-dimensional space. And then we'll get to the actual uh, quaternion algebra in four dimensions that Hamilton introduced. So we have to go up to four dimensions and understand a little bit of the geometry of four dimensions to get at these uh, quaternions. Now this is a subject which uh, is quite important these days because working with rotations is something that we do a lot in, in industrial work, in graphics, in computer programming, for example in video game construction. So there's lots of situations where we want to manipulate rotations effectively. And it turns out that quaternions are probably still the best and most efficient way of doing that. It's a lovely subject that, um, that undergraduates can learn about. So I'm going to give you an introduction to Hamilton's quaternions in these next three lectures. I'm going to start off with this much simpler situation, complex numbers and rotations in the plane. There will be a lot of material in this uh, lecture, none of it too sophisticated, but some of it a bit novel, because I have a rational point of view towards things. And it turns out that this rational point of view is a very good way of understanding things and makes a lot of higher geometry much simpler. So even if you're very familiar with complex numbers, you're going to learn some important things in today's lecture. If you haven't seen complex numbers before, well, this is probably something of an introduction. You can also have a look at the Wild Trig 15 uh, video, which was made quite a few years ago now, but uh, it also has some information on complex numbers. You might want to watch that before you have a look at this. So don't hesitate in stopping the video, going back, making sure you understand um, everything that I'm saying here. All right, we're starting with uh, complex numbers, but I adopt a rational point of view because I don't believe in irrational numbers. That's not a, a religious position, it's just that I haven't seen any, and no one has actually shown me a proper irrational number, so why should I believe in them? It's a very good position that I encourage you to adopt as well. You might think that it diminishes one's mathematics, but it turns out that it does exactly the opposite. It strengthens one's mathematics because one can then look carefully and clearly and logically at so many things which previously require waffling. So a complex number for us is a pair, A, B, of rational numbers. And this is what I used to denote the type of rational numbers. I prefer not to think in terms of infinite sets. Pictorially, we have a xy plane. The pair AB can be thought of as this point here with x coordinate A, y coordinate B. Or it can also be thought of as the vector from the origin to this point. And sometimes it's best to think in terms of a point, and sometimes it's better to think in terms of a vector. But in fact, logically speaking, the complex number is neither of those. It's just the pair of rational numbers. Complex numbers support operations. Actually, they support all four operations of addition, multiplication, subtraction, and division. But here are the two main ones of addition and multiplication. Addition is pointwise, corresponding to the usual vector sum of vectors. The multiplication is where all the interest lies. So the formula is that AB times CD is, by definition, A times C minus B times D. That's the first entry. And then the second entry is A times D plus B times C. So we make the definition. That's just how we're going to define multiplication of these ordered pairs of rational numbers. And it turns out that's a very good choice because it has lovely properties. Namely, these operations satisfy the following familiar laws of arithmetic. First of all, the two operations are commutative. Z plus W equals W plus Z, and Z times W equals W times Z. Please check that. We have associativity. That if you have three complex numbers, it doesn't matter in what order we pair them. So Z plus W plus U is the same as Z plus W plus U. And more importantly, 
for multiplication as well. Z times W times U is the same as Z times W times U. Then there's a distributive law, Z times W plus U equals ZW plus ZU. And here I'm allowing myself the uh, shortcut, ZW means Z times W. All right, these laws are relatively straightforward to verify, except perhaps for this one. This is the most interesting one, the associativity of the multiplication. That turns out to be somewhat non-trivial. You actually have to make a calculation for that. And I please urge you, if you haven't done this in your mathematical career yet, make this calculation. Check that this is true. And then you might like to think, well, what happens if we modify this definition a little bit? Suppose we decide to make a new multiplication by changing that minus sign to a plus sign. Or maybe that plus sign into a minus sign. Or maybe sticking a factor of 2 in front of the AD or some other variant like that. You will find that then this multiplication property here tends to not be satisfied. So you will get an appreciation for the beauty of this particular definition. It just happens to work for that associative property. We'll also define a few special complex numbers. So 0 is just the pair 0, 0. And 1 is the pair 1, 0. And then you can check that this, not this 1 has the property that 1 times z is z times 1 is z. So it's the multiplicative identity. And this 0 has the property that 0 plus z equals z plus 0 equals z. Okay, so we can also define subtraction and division, but I'm not going to do that. This is, the, this is the essence of the algebraic structure of the complex numbers. And this is an example of what is called an algebra in uh, mathematics. A little bit of an unfortunate name because algebra has uh, these different meanings, but anyway, that's the complex numbers. I've now repeated the multiplication here so we can uh, refer to it. And I now want to point out that there are some other sort of special complex numbers that play distinguished roles. First of all, the numbers of the form a comma zero, where the second coefficient is zero, those numbers correspond to points on the x-axis. And their arithmetic is particularly simple. You can check that additively, a0 plus b0 is just a plus b0, and a0 times b0 multiplicatively, we get the product ab0. So that if we restrict our attention to this real axis, then the complex numbers there act just like the usual rational numbers. So we can think of the ordinary rational numbers as being embedded in our picture in terms of the points on the x-axis. Now multiplication by such a real complex number, so often these ones are called the real complex numbers, which uh, is possibly a source of confusion because I don't believe in real numbers in the, the usual sense, but um, that shouldn't prevent me from being able to use the adjective real. And so here we're just going to say that any complex number whose second coordinate is zero, we're going to call that a real complex number, even though in fact the entry A is actually a rational number. So if we multiply by such a real complex number A comma zero, then we see that it acts by scaling by A. So let's check. If we multiply A0 by CD, the rule is we take A times C minus 0 times D. So that's just A times C. And then we get A times D plus 0 times C. So that's just A times D. So what has happened is that each of these entries has gotten multiplied by A. And A is just an ordinary rational number. And let's agree that we use a sort of vector space terminology here, a notation, and agree that we can pull that a out front if it's common to both terms, and so we can rewrite this as a times cd. So here the a is just a rational number, we're just talking about scaling the vector by multiplying it by a. So that's what happens when we multiply any complex number by a0. For example, if we multiply that complex number by a0, a here is somewhere between 1 and 2, say, then it would mean that this vector would enlarge by a factor of 
of A, so it would become roughly twice as long. So the, the product would be up there somewhere. On the other hand, it's also interesting to consider complex numbers which lie on the y-axis. They also have a distinguished role. And let's put them in. So these are sometimes called, well, they're called imaginary complex numbers. Imaginary complex numbers. are the ones that are lying on the y-axis that have the form 0 comma a. So what happens if we multiply by 0 a? Have a look. Here's our basic law for multiplication. So we get 0 times c minus a times d for a total of minus a times d. And the second entry is 0 times d plus a times c or a c. If we pull out the common a as we did before then this is a times minus d c. So what's the relationship between minus d c and c d? Well, if here is c d, then here is minus d c. It's really the same vector except that it's been rotated by a quarter turn. So a quarter of the way all the way around. That's a right angle there. These two vectors are perpendicular. That's 90 degrees if we're measuring an angle. Spread of 1 if we're measuring with rational trigonometry. So the effect of multiplying by 0 comma a is to take this vector, multiply it, scale it by a, and rotate it by a quarter turn. So multiplying by a 0 just dilates but multiplying by 0a dilates and rotates by a quarter turn. So we're already seeing some geometry, some geometrical transformation associated to the algebraic structure. So the complex number which is on the y-axis and has coordinate 1, 0, 1, has a special role in the subject and it's usually given a special name. So that's the complex number i. And it's interesting because when we square it, let's see what happens. i squared is equal to 0, 1 times 0, 1. We're going to get 0 times 0 minus 1 times 1, so that's minus 1. And we're going to get 0 times 1 plus 1 times 0, so that's 0. So we're getting this number minus 1, 0, which is really like the number, the rational number, minus 1. Because we've said that the numbers ending in 0 are really acting like the rational numbers. So we can agree that we're going to call this number just minus 1. In that case, i squared is equal to minus 1. So we have this algebraic system now where we have this new number called i which has this remarkable property that no rational number does, namely its square is minus 1. And we can see that geometrically, from what we were just saying in terms of rotation, if we multiply by i, well, then we just rotate by 90 degrees, or a quarter turn. And so if we do that twice, if we multiply by i squared, we're taking every vector and changing it to its negative. So we're rotating essentially by 180 degrees, or a half turn, which is essentially to negate any vector. It's a geometrical interpretation of this equation. And now we're going to use this particular complex number to simplify or give an alternate form for complex numbers. So instead of writing the pair a, b, we'll think of this as being a times 1, 0 plus b times 0, 1. And this 1, 0 is really the number 1, which we don't need to write. And this 0, 1 is this new number i. So we can write this expression as a plus bi. That's an alternate form for complex numbers, which is the one that we're going to probably use in practice most. With this notation, this particular equation is really the only thing that we have to remember when we're multiplying. We can forget almost about that original rule, as illustrated here. Suppose we want to multiply 3 plus 5i with minus 2 plus i. Then if we're just going to do this using 
the distributive law, we get 3 times 2, minus 2 is minus 6. 3 times i is plus 3i. 5i times minus 2 is minus 10i. And 5i times i is 5i squared. Well, if i squared is equal to minus 1, then we should replace this thing with a minus 1 to give us minus 6 minus 5. And then the i's combine as 3 minus 10i, giving us all together minus 11 minus 7i. And you can check that this is the same thing that you would get if you uh, did the original multiplication in terms of this times this minus this times this. And this times this plus this times this. It's that the, the advantage is that we don't actually have to remember the formula for multiplication. We only have to remember this very simple law and use natural distributivity. All right, and then numbers like this, 0a, can be just written as a times i. So these are the imaginary complex numbers that lie on the y-axis. All right, now let's introduce a little bit more terminology. And then the main theorem, the most important fact about complex numbers. So if z is equal to a, b, or in our new notation, a plus b, i, then let's give a name to these numbers a and b. Let's call A the real part of Z and denote it by this RE of Z. And let's denote the rational number B as the imaginary part of Z and denoted by IM of Z. Note that these are both rational numbers. Let's define the complex conjugate. So if we take the complex number Z and we put a little bar over it, that means complex conjugate. And what you're going to do is you're going to take the pair and you're going to negate the second coefficient. In terms of a plus bi, that changes to a minus bi. So that's the complex conjugate of z. That's an important uh, idea in complex numbers. And uh, we're going to use that to define the quadrants of the complex number. So the quadrants of the complex number z is q of z. It's by definition z times z bar. It's what you get when you multiply this times this. Now that's a difference of squares. So if you multiply a plus bi times a minus bi, you can get a squared minus bi squared. But i squared being minus 1, that amounts to a squared plus b squared. So what we're getting is the sum of the squares of the coefficients of the complex number z. And if you think in terms of a diagram and Pythagoras' theorem, this represents the area of the square that Euclid would have built on the segment from 0 to the point z. It's the quantity that appears as the, the hypotenuse area in Pythagoras' theorem. Now, an important point. In ordinary texts, one then uses this. In fact, one doesn't give this thing a name. One goes directly to what's considered more fundamental, namely the, the length of the complex number z. By taking a square root of this, we do not want to do that. Okay? We do not want to use square roots if we can avoid it. Square roots properly take us outside of pure mathematics because the square root is actually very subtle, problematic construction. As evidenced by the fact that if I ask you what square root of 13 is, you can't give me a precise answer. Your calculator will spit out a certain number of digits, but you don't actually have a number whose square is 13. In fact, the existence of square root of 13, as I argue in my Math Foundations series, is highly suspect. So we're going to avoid that. We're not going to mention length of vectors or moduli of complex numbers. This is a big step up conceptually, actually. Okay? So not using that means that we have to make everything algebraic. We're forced, essentially, in the right direction in terms of our thinking. So I know this is a little bit novel to many of you, but believe me, there's much to be said for it. In particular, we have this main theorem, which looms as an absolute pillar of the subject. 
which is that if you have two complex numbers, z and w, then the quadrants of the product z times w is the product of quadrants of z times quadrants of w. So the quadrants of a product is the product of the quadrants. So let's prove it. Let's say that z is equal to a plus bi and w equals c plus di. Then the left hand side, what does it look like? Well we have to multiply z and w and then there will be two coefficients and we have to take the first coefficient squared plus the second coefficient squared. That's what the quadrants of z times w is. So here I hope you recognize this is the, the real part of the product AC minus BD. And the imaginary part of the product is AD plus BC. So we have to take this squared plus this squared. That's the left hand side. The right hand side is the quadrants of Z, that's A squared plus B squared, times the quadrants of W, which is C squared plus D squared. So the assertion is that this equals this for any rational numbers A, B, C, and D. And this is an identity of Fibonacci, Leonardo of Pisa. And in fact, possibly it goes back to Diophantus, 300 years after Christ. Let's check why it's true. If we square this, we're going to get AC squared, which is this term here, plus BD squared, which is this term, minus twice the product. Let's forget about minus twice the product temporarily. When we square this thing, we're going to get AD squared, which is this times this, plus BC squared, this times this, plus twice the product. All right, so minus twice the product over here is minus 2 times A times C times B times D, and plus twice the product here is 2 times A times D times B times C. Those two terms are conveniently exactly the same with opposite signs, so they cancel, and the equality is obvious. So this drives this basic result. Very important, crucial identity that's somehow at the heart of the beauty and usefulness of complex numbers in terms of rotations. So while quadrants is a rational analog of length or distance, what is a rational analog of angle? Traditional treatments of complex numbers rely heavily on the notion of length and angle for polar coordinates for complex numbers. Maybe it's inconceivable to you that you could study the subject without those two concepts if you're very familiar with complex numbers. But in fact, you can. There are rational analogs of angle and there are a number of different possibilities. One of them is the spread from rational trigonometry, or the turn, or the half turn. The turn is also described in my book. Uh, the half turn I'm going to talk about in the Math Foundations or the Wild Trig series. It's, uh, it's something else that's also very interesting. Today I'm going to tell you about the, the turn, which is a very natural uh, idea that's closely connected with the geometry of lines in the XY plane. So here is a number z equals a plus bi, x coordinate a, y coordinate b, and here's a vector joining the origin to z. We're going to define the turn of z to be the slope of this line. The slope is by definition the change in the y coordinate divided by the change in the x coordinate. So the y coordinate is b, the x-coordinate is a, and that's how we're going to define the turn of this complex number. So geometrically, we're going to relate it to a slope of a line. Now, more generally, what we really want to do is to define the turn between two vectors. So this would be the turn between the vector, uh, say, 1, 0, and z, but more generally if we have z1 is a1 plus b1i and z2 is a2 plus b2i, 
then it turns out that this is the formula for the turn, which is a generalization of this slope of line. What is it? So u, the turn from z1 to z2, is by definition a1 b2 minus a2 b1 in the numerator, and the denominator a1 a2 plus b1 b2. Now these two expressions look a lot like the coefficients of the products of z1 and z2. And if you think about it actually for a little while you see that, so these are the complementary expressions that are linear in the various variables, complementary to the two expressions that are used in the product. This you may also recognize as a determinant. Essentially it's a, an area of a parallelogram formed by the two vectors. And this here you recognize as a dot product between the two vectors. Now this particular expression is very nice. It's the definition of the turn from Z1 to Z2. And in the special case when the first vector is say 1, 0, then you can check that this thing reduces to this one here. There's one more thing to be said that there is a slight problem with this definition if A is 0. In other words, if the complex number is perpendicular to the x-axis, or 90 degrees, then the turn is either undefined or infinite. And that will also happen here in this more general case. If the two vectors are perpendicular, say z1 and z2 are perpendicular, then the turn will be undefined. By the way, here's the terminology that I like to use. So it's uh, given by this little straight line with a little arrow, and there's the u. The arrow here denotes that the, the object has an orientation. It depends on which complex number is first and which one is second. You can check that if you change the order, then the turn negates. All right, so this is how we're going to express the turn from z1 to z2. It's a number associated to the two complex numbers that measures somehow how far apart they are. It's a replacement for angle, but it's a rational replacement. No transcendental functions or definitions are required. And here's the main theorem for turns. The theorem that asserts that if we have three complex numbers, z, w, and v, with v not zero, then the turn from z to w is the same as the turn from z times v to w times v. In other words, when we multiply both z and w by the same complex number, we get two new complex numbers, z, v, and w, v. The turn between them is the same as the turn between the original z and w. So this is a rational analog to the statement that when we multiply by a complex number, the angles between two complex numbers don't change. All right, so what's the proof? Z, let's say, is A plus BI, W is C plus DI, and let's suppose that V is X plus YI. So let's calculate this thing here. All right, so we have to calculate Z times V and W times V, and then we have to apply the formula for the turn on the previous page. All right, so Z times V is going to be, well, there's going to be an AX minus BY, that's going to be the first term. And then there's going to be an AY plus BX. And the W times V is going to have terms CX minus YD. And the next one, CY plus DX. And then you can check that this numerator here is the determinant formed by those two vectors that we just mentioned. So the first coefficient of ZV times the second coefficient of this one minus the first coefficient of this one times the second coefficient of that one. And here in the bottom is the dot product or inner product of those two vectors. The products of the two first coefficients plus the products of the two second coefficients. 
And now you have to expand this. All right, so please do this. It's a good algebraic exercise. Expand the numerator, expand the denominator, and stare at them both individually and convince yourself that they both factor. Right? The numerator factors as x squared plus y squared times ad minus bc, and the denominator factors as x squared plus y squared times ac plus bd. And since we're assuming this v is non-zero, the x squared plus y squared has to be non-zero. So we're talking about rational numbers here. And so conveniently, these two terms cancel, and we're left with the term between z and w. It's a lovely calculation that uh, replaces the usual fuddling around with uh, cosines and sines and formulas for cos a plus b and so on. Okay? This is without any transcendental notions. That's a big step up, in fact. So it's something that's um, well worth thinking about. So the invariance of turn under multiplication. Mathematics is a very conservative subject, especially pure mathematics. And uh, many mathematicians have said to me, yes, Norman, that's all very good, uh, rational approach, probably very interesting. But what about, what about just the additivity of angles? With angles, we can add them. An angle of 3 degrees plus an angle of 4 degrees, you get an angle of 7 degrees. Well, that's true, but it's a very heavy price to pay. The machinery and the transcendental business that you have to put into the subject in order to try to get at that linearity. It's an attempt to force linearity on the circular structure, which doesn't really want to go from a theoretical point of view. This exercise here gives you a an rational analog to this additive structure. Suppose that you have three complex numbers, z1, z2, z3, and we measure the turns between all three pairs. So let's say u1 is the turn between z2 and z3, u2 is the turn between z3 and z1, and u3 is the turn between z1 and z2. Remember the order matters, so I'm kind of doing this in a cyclical order so it's all symmetrical. Okay, so a great exercise. Prove then that these three turns satisfy the following pleasant relation. U1 plus U2 plus U3 equals U1, U2, U3. And please do it without any reference to tans of angles. Okay? This is a purely rational result. It deserves a purely rational proof. Notice that it means in particular that if you know two of those turns, then you have a linear equation for the third one. So while it's not quite as simple as just adding the two turns, it's not that much more complicated. All right, now let's have a look at a very interesting circle of ideas. I want to connect the unit circle in the complex plane, which plays a very important role, to the projective line of lines through the origin, to the idea of rotations of the plane centered at zero. So these three subjects are all intimately connected. I'm going to remind you of our main theorem with quadrants that quadrants of z times w is quadrants of z times quadrants of w. And in particular, if you have a point gamma which lies on this unit circle, so the unit circle has equation x squared plus y squared equals 1 in x, y coordinates. In terms of complex numbers, well, it's those complex numbers whose quadrants is equal to 1. Or, if you like, z times z bar equals 1. So three different ways of writing down the equation of the unit circle. So suppose that gamma is on the unit circle. And we consider what happens if we multiply, say, w by gamma. W is out here somewhere. If we multiply by gamma, then we get the quadrants of gamma times the quadrants of w. But the quadrants of gamma is 1. And that tells us that the quadrants of gamma times w is the same as the quadrants of w. In other words, multiplying by gamma does not change the quadrants of a vector. So if you have a w out here and you 
multiply by gamma, what's going to happen is that you're going to stay on the big circle through W. You're going to rotate along that circle. So multiplication by gamma is a rotation of the entire plane. So there's an intimate connection between rotations and points on the unit circle because after all if we have any rotation centered at zero then this number one is going to get sent to another point on the unit circle and the rotation is determined by that point that we get. So the moral is that rotations of the plane, at least centered at zero, and points on the unit circle are intimately connected. For every rotation, there's a point on the unit circle, and for every point on the unit circle, there's a rotation. Now, what's uh, more interesting now is that we're going to throw in a third aspect, the projective line. Alright, so in projective geometry, the projective line in this kind of situation is obtained by looking at lines through the origin. That one there, as an example, or we can take any line through the origin. So that space of lines is what's called the projective line. So here's a typical line. Let's say it goes through the point A plus BI. Say that point is Z. And I remind you again that all numbers are rational numbers. So A and B are rational numbers. We're only considering lines that go through the origin and a rational point. Now this line is determined by Z but it's also determined by any non-zero multiple of z. So we sometimes write square brackets of z to denote the line, meaning that we can multiply z by any non-zero rational number, and it's the same line. All right, so there's a very important but somewhat subtle connection between the projective line and the unit circle. And what is it? Well, if you've been classically trained, you probably think that what you do is you take Z and you divide by its modulus. This is the standard way of getting a unit vector, or a unit complex number, from a general complex number. You divide by the modulus. So that means we take this and we have to divide by the square root of A squared plus B squared. But as I've tried to explain, the square root of a squared plus b squared is a highly problematic concept. And if we're working rationally, as we are here, it doesn't figure in our picture. So that's not an option for us. This is a very familiar construction in standard complex analysis, but it's not available to us thinking rationally. Now you might say, well, that's a, that, that's a problem for you, Norman. I mean, you, we can do something that you can't. Well. Whether you can actually do it or just talk about it is a question. But the point is that there is something better that we can do to replace this idea. And it's going to be very important for us to understand what that is. It's a replacement. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We are going to take this line and we're going to take the point 1. And we're going to reflect the point 1 in this line. So that's like a reflection. Right. So how do we do a reflection? Well, we take a line through here, which is perpendicular, something like that. That's perpendicular. And then we go up to here. It's going to meet the circle in the second point here. And this point here is the reflection of one in this line. And notice that it's unique. That's quite different from the, the idea of taking this thing and, and dividing by its modulus to finding a unit vector which is on this line. In rational geometry, a line through the origin does not have to meet the circle. So the existence of this point and this point, this intersection between the line circle, is problematic. Maybe it exists and maybe it doesn't. It depends on a quadratic equation determined by A and B. But this point 
always exists. It's there no matter what. We can always reflect this point in that point. All right, so, well, okay, but well, what is this point? How can we write it efficiently? Well, it turns out there's a very nice and beautiful way of doing that. And we can see that by drawing this line here and going out a little bit further. Imagine it going out a little bit. So the trick is to consider this complex number Z and to multiply it by Z. Where will that get us? Well, if we multiply this by Z, we're going to get Z squared. And Z squared is going to be up here somewhere. I'm going to do it in red. Up here somewhere is going to be Z squared. I'll put it in red so you can see it. Z squared. And it's going to be up there where this turn and this turn are equal. This turn, say you, and this turn, you are equal. Because multiplying by z, will take one to this, and we'll take this to this. So it preserves the turn here, going to the turn there. That's the main theorem about turns. The turn between one and z is the same as the turn between z and z squared. And so that line is going to meet that point. And that point is equal to this thing divided by its quadrants. So this point here is actually z squared over the quadrants of z. It's the same kind of thing that we were trying to do here, but because this is z squared, the quadrants of this is the square of the quadrants of z. That's a property of this thing here. The quadrants of z squared is the quadrants of z all squared. So when we divide z squared by the quadrants of z, we're on the unit circle. So what a beautiful thing that is. So that's a way of associating to a line a point. And if you change z by multiplying it by a scalar, multiply it by 2, or by 3, or by minus 1, this point is not going to change. So you multiply z by lambda, then there's going to be a lambda squared appearing up there, and there's going to be a lambda squared appearing down there, and they're going to cancel. So it doesn't matter what z you choose on that line, you perform z squared mod divided by q of z, you're always going to get that point. This is a very important idea. And is somehow at the heart of a certain two-to-oneness which appears throughout this subject. And it's often considered a, a feature of the quaternion business, but you should appreciate that it's already existing here in the complex numbers. That if we want to associate a rotation to this line, the way to do it is to associate to it the rotation by z squared over q of z. Very good diagram to spend a couple of hours staring at it and to think about it. So let's try to understand this structure by looking at a sort of special case. But first let's um, identify that what we've managed to do is to associate to every complex number z, which is non-zero, a rotation. Let's call it phi sub z, where this rotation is defined as follows. It's defined as phi of z acting on a complex number w is multiplying w by z squared over q of z. Because z squared over q of z is a unit complex number. It lies on the unit circle. And so this is necessarily a rotation that depends on z. I'll just mention that there's another nice way of writing it. Remember that q of z was equal to z times the complex conjugate z bar. And so if we write it that way, then two of the z's on top and bottom cancel, and we can write it as z times w over z bar. It's another way of writing it. So um, that's quite nice, and it has the property that if you multiply z by a rational number, 
then the rotation doesn't change. So the rotation only depends on the line through the origin through Z. And you can also check as a nice exercise that if you compose two rotations, 5Z, 5W, that's the same as 5Z times W. Now I want to connect that circle of ideas with a very classical subject which is close to my heart, which I've mentioned in quite a few of my videos. It's a very important thing that all undergraduates should be well aware of. And that's the rational parameterization of a circle. And in fact, that's really drops out from looking at what we've just done. Okay, so a bit of complex analysis allows us to rethink this rational parameterization in a very pleasant way. And the idea is that, well, if let's say we're interested in lines through the origin, the space of lines through the origin can be described as essentially a line plus a point at infinity. So if I take this line here, this green line, which has equation real part of z equals 1, so all the complex numbers on here are of the form z equals 1 plus it, where t is some, some number. All right, if we take any one like this, then the point on it, join it to the origin, we get a line. And all lines through the origin are of that form for some t, except for the sort of special case where we're just looking at this parallel one, which is sort of the case when t is infinite. All right. But otherwise, all lines meet this green line in exactly one point. Let's call it 1 plus i t. All right, now that's a rather interesting point. Let's have a look at what happens if we do this construction that we talked about, where we will calculate z squared over q of z when z happens to be the special complex number 1 plus i t. So if z is equal to 1 plus i t, then z squared over q of z, what is it? Well, first of all, what is z squared? z squared will be 1 minus t squared plus i times 2t. 1 minus t squared plus 2t times i. But we have to divide by q of z. What's q of z? It's the sum of the squares of the coefficient. So it's 1 plus t squared. So we get 1 minus t squared over 1 plus t squared plus 2t over 1 plus t squared i. And we know that that's a point on the unit circle. And moreover, it's exactly the point that we get by doubling this angle, if you like, or taking this turn and applying an equal turn to it. There it is right there. So while z squared is up here generally, then dividing by q of z scales it down so that it gets on the unit circle. And this point is also the reflection of the point 1 in this line. Now this is the familiar rational parameterization of the unit circle that goes back essentially to Euclid. Every rational point on the unit circle is exactly of this form. That's the x-coordinate, that's the y-coordinate, for some rational number t. Except for the special case when you have minus 1, which sort of corresponds to t equals infinity. Uh, there's a few other things I would just like to mention about this which are interesting too. The other property is that if you take the line from minus 1 to this point z squared over q of z, that that's actually parallel to the line that we started with. Why is that? Well, it's because here, you see, that's u, that's a turn of u, and that's a turn of u. And so this turn subtended by this chord at the center is related to this turn subtended by that same chord at the circumference. That's going to be a turn of u as well. It's elementary geometry of the circle. So this line is actually parallel to this line. And if we um, just move everything over by 1, then the point 1 plus it, if we translate it over by 1, it just becomes the point it. And so the meaning of t, if you like, you can think of it uh, here, is it's the, um, the point on the y-axis that you need to choose and then connect it to minus 1 and then that line will meet the unit circle at this point 
1 minus t squared over 1 plus t squared, 2t over 1 plus t squared. And then connecting things with the rotation, phi of z, once we have this point on the unit circle, associated to that is the rotation multiplication by that point, what we're calling phi of z. And that's the rotation that physically takes the point 1 and rotates it to that point there. Takes this point and rotates it to there. So it's rotation like that. That's the rotation phi of z. And for future reference, I'd like to also remind you that that rotation can also be thought of as a product of two reflections. All right, so there's this list line here, and then there's this line here that we're considering. If we take the product of the reflection in this line, followed by the reflection in this line, what do we get? To some point here, and you reflect it first in the x-axis, and then you reflect it in this line here, you're going to get a point here, which is the same as the rotation of the original point um, phi of z. So this rotation determined by this unit circle is also associated to this line in another way. That is basically the product of this reflection times this reflection. All right, so this is uh, quite a lot of material. If you haven't seen complex numbers before, of course, it will probably be uh, overwhelming to you. If you have seen some complex numbers before, I hope this provides a somewhat different view on things. And this two-to-one aspect is going to be very important for us when we try to understand quaternions. So this is a very good thing to try to understand first. It makes understanding quaternions so much easier. As good practice for you, you might like to calculate the turn associated to the vector, uh, say, 1, 0, and this ve unit vector that we found here. So in other words, the turn u, this turn here, is t, because that's t and that's 1, so the slope is t. So if that's a turn of u and that's a turn of u, then what's the combined turn from here to here? In fact, you can think about what happens if you combine more turns of u's three turns of u, four turns of u, and so on. What is the turn of the composite turn? It's a very nice little uh, formula. And of course, we all want to do that without any transcendental functions, no circular functions, no mention of angles. So in our next video, we're now going to go up to three-dimensional space and start discussing rotations. The problem of rotations. How do we describe rotations in three-dimensional space? And in particular, how do we compose rotations? I hope you'll join me for that. I'm Norman Wahlberger. Thanks for listening.